Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. I want to just uh, work the technology a little bit. Is it here? There we go. It's my honor to be here today. I'm so privileged to share a few moments with you. I know I might be the only municipal government official, elected official represented here. Uh, I've been asked to share some costs related to trash. We all hear about the philosophical call to prayer toward environmental preservation. And sometimes it isn't until we actually see what something costs that it actually matters to us. And so I am here to talk about the city of Long Beach and what the cost really is of pollution to my small city. And it is a small city. I know there are those of you who are watching from across the universe. And it reminds me that while Sometimes this is just in my backyard. It really is your backyard as well. I have a city of 500,000 people, small city, certainly not the population of Delhi or Dhaka or Indonesia, anywhere else, Sao Paulo, but it is a small city, but it is reflective of some of the problems we face because of plastic pollution, the costs that we incur, and really the opportunity costs of not spending those dollars somewhere else. That really is how I look at this. As an elected official, my number one charge is not to clean up the beaches but I spend millions of dollars every year to clean up the beaches on my city. My number one charge, perhaps, is public safety. Is it public education? Is it quality of life? All of these things are interconnected, but somehow I find myself spending millions of dollars on cleaning up the beaches. And so I will share some details with you. I'll share some very boring numbers. And what I hope that we actually think is, how much of that could be spent somewhere else? How much of those resources could have been spent for the children that we talk about, for the underprivileged, for the undereducated, and for the impoverished? It really is the opportunity cost. And sometimes the unseen costs of pollution is what keep us from doing the right thing. We talk about things not being in our backyard. It really is our backyard. This is my backyard. Behind this trash that we see is City Hall. It's where I spend most of my, my working time. I actually lived for seven years close to City Hall, so that is my backyard. This is what it looks like in the city of Long Beach after a major storm event. Not so major, it's not necessary for it to be a traumatic storm event, but just enough that I have 51 miles of the Los Angeles River creating a landfill scenario in my city. So we've seen photographs of Saudi Arabia, we've seen photographs from across the world. We don't expect to see this in the United States. I don't think so. I was born in India. I was actually born near a slum in Madras. This is something I perhaps would expect to see as I was growing up. Never would have expected to see this in Long Beach, California. The beach and river cleanup costs are tremendous. This requires strategies, both mechanical, technological, and really the human power that goes into cleaning this up. The costs of source control strategies are astronomical, and then we have legislation and educational efforts that we're trying to spend some resources on, but really we don't have that much we're able to spend. The one thing that I do know is regardless of what happens, whether it's in this small city or any other city across the world, the action or inaction of each and every one of us really controls all our destiny. This really is our backyard, whether we are thousands of miles away or just a couple of miles away, and as I am for most of my day, just really about a mile away. And this family in this photograph is one of the families that comes out very regularly to clean up after a storm event. That looks like a lonely photo, and that's exactly what I think a lot of us feel when it comes to cleaning up pollution. It is a very lonely endeavor. And so you have the swath of land that actually covers not, not that much of our coastline, but a good portion of our coastline. And what you end up finding is that you have a few people that come out and do their deed do what they can to actually assist in cleaning this up. What we've realized as a city, even though we are at the mouth of a river, a 51-mile river, what we realize is that since we are the landfill for 51 miles of the Los Angeles River, we have to take action in order to control our own destiny. And so we've started to do that. When we look at the watershed, the Los Angeles River, 
we see how much of the upstream pollution affects Long Beach at the mouth of the river. I always say that we are the landfill, we are the dumping zone for all the dozens of cities upstream. The Los Angeles River is 824 square miles, 51 miles of river. So that's 44 percentage of my city's drainage area. We know that about 95 percent of the debris that ends up along our coastline comes from the Los Angeles River. This is an undeniable fact. We're also impacted by the San Gabriel River, which is 689 square miles, 75 miles of which is the river. That's only about 7 percent of our drainage area. Still very significant. Interestingly, I was born in Madras, India, and whenever I look at the photograph of the watershed area, it reminds me of a map of India, and I was born exactly at that tip that's reflected here where Long Beach is. So I wonder if there's some meaning to why I've ended up in just geographically the same sort of place where I started. I think there is a reason. We all draw our life, our first breath from some place in the universe which forms us and makes us who we are. I am originally from Kerala, India. I am accustomed to reusing everything. I spent most of my childhood with that concept. There's no such thing as a single-use bag when I was growing up. We use bags for shopping that my grandmother had woven 10 years before. We still use those bags, but somehow along the way, what we have convinced developing nations or emerging economies is that the sign of modernity is waste. We have convinced those societies that have survived for thousands of years by using everything. And in Kerala, India, everything is reused. It is a very tropical setting. Trash was unseen. I went back for the first time in a couple of years, about two months ago, and saw my first landfill. And I wrote a note to the director of Heal the Bay, who's in the audience today, and I said, my heart is broken. I've seen my first landfill in my home state of Kerala, and all I see is white blobs, which were the plastic bags. That I did not expect. But again, I see with the emerging middle class that that is what we convince people who have for generations been impoverished. We convince them that the sign of wealth and progress is to be disposable and to behave in a very disposable manner, discarding the things from our pockets, discarding the things from our cars, and really not thinking twice about it. And we have to reverse that. We have to go back to the way we used to do things. These photographs are reflective of, again, those white blobs that I talk about. Much of what you see is plastic. On average, 6,000 tons, tons of garbage per year end up on Long Beach's coastline. That's a lot of trash. It's not all originating from the city of Long Beach, but it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter where this trash comes from. It all flows to us. We are the landfill. It costs the city $2.2 million a year to clean this up. That's $2.2 million that I'm just spending to maintain. I'm not improving anything. I'm not going beyond anything. I'm not giving greater quality of life just to really maintain it costs $2.2 million. Just to put that into context, our last budget cycle, we almost killed ourselves to try and find $18 million to maintain police staffing where it is, to maintain firefighting where it is, parks and recreation. It took us a great, great effort. So $2.2 million spending just to clean this up is, is a huge sum that I think I could have perhaps added to my citizens' quality of life if I was able to spend it some other way but instead we're cleaning up our beaches, which is a worthwhile endeavor, but I often think it doesn't cost anything to retain the trash that we deposit loosely. It costs nothing, but because most of the time we can't see where it goes, it's not something that we think about twice. Now, I would be very un-American if I didn't show you all my big toys. So as, as Americans go, we have very big toys to tackle this very big problem. We have taken it on like another war, and uh, we've brought out all our big guns and our big toys, and the one on the left is called the Predator, so we have big names to match our big toys. Unfortunately, some of our cars are just as this big. But what the Predator actually does is it, it is our, our raking system. It rakes all of the debris, collects it, and it collects it in a way that's manageable for us to actually pick up. Uh, unfortunately, it is a very large instrument. It's a costly instrument. 
It's something that I wish we didn't have to invest resources in, but I'm certainly glad that we do. The one on the right is called the beach rake. A lot of the debris actually ends up from the water onto the sand. And so we go through the sand periodically, sifting it for a lot of the trash. And whether it's the cigarette butt or just a discarded straw or that great American invention, the spork, which is still with us, we find this in our sand. And so as small as those things are, it's something as big as this that actually helps us pick these things up. These are very costly instruments, and if I might just share with you what the actual costs are, the Predator itself costs about $18 million. Uh, it's something that it costs us that much to install, to maintain, to have. It's very costly. If we look at the trash net systems, which are much more sophisticated. These are installed on the channels of the Los Angeles River to capture the trash and the debris. And between 2004 and 2008, we've collected about 800,000 pounds of debris. These two are very costly. To install a system at each of the pump stations, it costs about 3.7 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. And when we transfer that to, into global context, it is just, a lot of dollars that could be spent feeding people, it could be spent educating children, it could be spent improving lives in so many ways, except we're cleaning up after human behavior. And it's tragic. It costs also about $9,000 per cleanup effort, and we do this several times a year. So the capital cost of five installations of these trash net systems is $18 million. And then the annual cost of maintenance is about $180 US thousand dollars. The other system that we have, and I have to share something with you. I'm an urban planner by education. I'm a legislator. I, I'm involved in public policy. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would have to know so much about technology, mechanics of things, how things work, what the latest technology is in trying to clean up after nasty human behavior, and here I am. So I never wish to know all of this, but I'm going to briefly tell you about one system that we're very proud of, and unfortunately we have to also invest in, and that's the Vortex Separation System. Imagine your washer, an American washer, and what we do is we take the trash and, and it actually spins it. It spins it and it separates it and so that the debris actually lands in, in a catch basin down below, and then the water is separated from it. Very intriguing, very interesting. Those of us who are into technology, it's an exciting piece of machinery, but again, one that I wish we didn't have to invest in. It too is costly. Each unit costs about $660,000. Again, we can calculate what the opportunity costs of, spending, of not spending that somewhere else is. Those Vortex systems collected about 130,000 pounds of trash just in a four-year period between 2004 and 2008. We are always cleaning up trash. I mean, it, these numbers are just, sometimes they're blinding and they're mind-numbing and you almost get to a point where it doesn't matter and they blur the page, but all I'm reminded is that we are constantly spending money where we probably should not have to if we all collectively did something different. We have another lower tech instrument that we use, and that's actually the treatment train catchment system, and that is the least expensive technology that we've invested in, and it just keeps the trash from entering in the storm drains. Those are very exciting to me personally. What it tells me is that really the bulk of the work that goes into cleanup, plastic pollution cleanup, any kind of trash cleanup, the bulk of that is low tech. A lot of it happens by people picking it up, but if I just take one step back, imagine how little money we'd have to spend if we just stop that behavior. And so the most effective thing that I think we have is, a t is this sort of catch basin that we've lined up and down the LA River. Recently, we received a grant to help the cities upstream because what we realize is this is our backyard, but it's really a backyard that's created by many, many cities. And so if I help my neighbor do better, then I will help myself do better. And so we've invested in upstream cities so that they too can 
can invest in their storm drain strategies just as we have. And that has been our strategy is if I help my neighbor improve, then my own areas will improve. And I think that that really should be a global strategy because there are no geographic boundaries. There are no political boundaries that separate us from the trash in Dubai or the trash in Cairo or the trash in Long Beach. We are so interconnected, it's undeniable. And so to assist one another globally, really we are assisting ourselves. The average cleanup costs are astronomical. Again, I mentioned that we spend about 2,200,000 US dollars for beach cleanups. The trash net systems, $18 million. Vortex system, $1 million. Treatment train, $377,000. We have invested $20 million just in my small city. City of a half a million people, but really a small city in the global context. That is $20 million that I could have spent some other way. There are so many worthwhile projects that need attention, but if I can just put it in basic terms, a lot of us actually look toward cities to provide public safety, that's $125,000 per police officer, $128,000 per firefighter. That is that many more public safety officers I could have had. But imagine how many more teachers I could have, or how many more parks directors I could have, recreation specialists. These are all very important notes to keep when it comes to the opportunity cost. We engage in legislation, we engage in education, we try to do what we can. I will share one thing. I am ashamed, although we are part of a very amazing economy in the state of California, when I traveled to Rajasthan just two months ago, that government banned single-use plastic bags it is an emerging nation, it is a developing nation for, in a lot of people's eyes. That same week I learned that my own state of California did not have the backbone, did not have the spine to pass the same legislation here. It tells me how in the grips of industry we are here and how in other nations by sheer necessity they are able to do the single act that we have been waiting for for so long. And so what we do as a city, Long Beach, we are not going to wait for the state to find its backbone. Backbone. We will find it for them, and we will do it in our own city. And that is what we pursue in terms of legislation and education. We will ban plastic bags in our own city. And that's the city I'd like you to see. I think if we all continue to do what we do, this call to prayer that we have in terms of environmental preservation, environmental efforts. It is not a single daily call to prayer, but it is one that we have to find in every single action. That's the LA River I'd like you to see and not really the landfill that you've seen before. Thank you.